Hello everyone, I'm Rishi Basad. Welcome back to a second series of Racing Weekly, a podcast and YouTube show brought to you by Odds Checker in association with Bet365. There's a lot coming up in the next hour or so. Alongside me once again, my old pal Sam Turner. It's great to be uh, with you again, Sam, and there's a lot for us to talk about. We're going to have Rob Hornby as a guest with us, arguably looking forward to the biggest week of his young riding career so far with his first ever ride in the Derby. We'll be talking to Tony Elliott of the Rogues Gallery. They've paid a lot of money to supplement Rogue Millennium for the Kazoo Oaks. And we'll also be catching up with Pat Cooney of Bet365 to talk to him about the betting for the two classics at Epsom. Uh, But we start, I'm afraid, on a rather sombre note, uh, because of course, uh, on Sunday, uh, we heard the news that the greatest jockey, arguably, of ours and any other generation, Lester Piggott, passed away at the age of 86. Uh, Sam, I know a lot of people who, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, were moved uh, a great deal mm-hmm. by Leicester's passing, and I assume that's mostly because of the, the great memories it brought back for so many racing fans around the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it was a really sad time, um, and, and sad that he's passed away Derby Week as well, and, you know, the the initial prognosis was that he was improving and hopefully he was going to come out of the, the Swiss hospital that he was in, but sadly that hasn't been the case. And all we could do is reflect on a life really, really well lived. I mean, quite an astonishing career when you go back and, and drill down into the data and see the numbers that he's managed to accumulate. I mean, you know, winning his first race at the age of 12, <laughs> I didn't got paper around by the time he was winning races around Haydock and schooling, yeah. you know, full-time jockeys. Um, winning group races at ridiculous ages, winning derbies at stupid ages as well. Um, it's just absolutely astonishing. And going all the way through the longevity of his career, mm. um, nine derbies, obviously, record, 116 Royal Ascot winners, a record, you know, winning Breeders' Cup miles on Royal Academy. I mean, if you haven't seen that footage of yeah. that race, I mean, go back and look at it on YouTube, kids, because it's unbelievable. That's the thing. You can recount so many different stories, so many different races, so many different moments that Lester Piggott is such an intrinsic part of in the sport of racing, uh, whether it's folklore, whether you saw it yourself. Yeah. Uh, you touched on Royal Academy in the Breeders' Cup mile. Would the that be? <laughs> <laughs> would that be the one that stands out for you? Well, only because I got into racing a little bit later, sort of mid eight, mid to late eighties, really. Um, so. Obviously, you know, God bless him, Leicester was in prison for a year of those, those, those 80s um, with the tax evasion charges. So, you know, I didn't see him in his pomp, really, you know, through the 70s, with you know, when he was linked with all those fa- fabulous horses, all mm. those great derby winners. Um, so I was a bit late to the party. I was watching Ian Botham's test career then, really, rather than horse racing. So um, it, it was then that he gave me a, a second chance, really, the fact that he came out of retirement and 12 days later went to the Breeders' Cup. Um, and, and rode Royal Academy, one of the most fantastic rides you've ever seen. And Orsney came down on the mm. turn, took a false step, and he's still with that typical Leicester rat tat yeah. Got up on the line, great commentary as well. Was it Trevor Demon? Yeah. Um, really added to the atmosphere of that race. And, you know, 54 year old Leicester Piggott, you know. And uh, we use the word legend. He was a legend, he was an icon. Yeah. You know, he, he was on another stratosphere to most legends, wasn't he? The greatest? Yeah, yeah. I think you can drop the arguably, can't you? Mm. I mean, Obviously, he, he he was a very clever manoeuvrer, yeah. as Bruce Raymond said. You know, you never knew you were actually going to ride your horse in the Derby until you were down at the start and getting loaded into the stalls because yeah. Leicester might jump yeah. on it. But he was, you know, his knowledge of the form book, and he made it his practice to know everything that was going on. Mm. Um, and he was obviously, you know, th- there was there was one person that mattered, and that was Leicester. But mm. if you were then allowed to be taken along with that, if you were an owner, a trainer, or whatever, and you've got Leicester on your side. You've got a great chance, haven't you, of winning a classic or winning a massive race because he just he dominated it. And it became a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, didn't mm. he? Those early Derby wins then sort of generated the, the reputation, and not the myth, because he actually backed it up with performances on the track, but it then got him onto other rides. And he was if Leicester wanted to ride your horse, that added you confidence, didn't it? I remember growing up, it was Muhammad Ali, Pele, yeah. Sir Don Bradman and Lester Piggott, four icons, four legends of of sports men at the time that you looked up to and you wondered uh, whether we'd ever see their likes again. Well, yeah, you you could probably throw, I was trying to think of people who've had that longevity in sport, you know, probably Jack Nicholas, Tom Watson. Mm -hmm. Tom Watson was still competing very late into his career, wasn't he, finishing runner-up in Opens and things like that. Um, But to be able to go and win massive races, 
when you were sort of 54, 55, yeah. um, having had the, the career that he had was just incredible. That, that hunger, quite literally. I mean, yeah. he lived probably for the first 20 years of his life on champagne and cigars, didn't he? Yeah, his first win came in 1948. His last came in 1994. Quite an incredible Both career. Haydock. Both at Haydock. And he won, a, he won a race at the Cheltenham Festival. 20 hurdle races he won, which I found absolutely yeah. astonishing. He won the bird lip selling hurdle at the Cheltenham <laughs> Festival. What is now the Cheltenham yeah. Festival? We could talk about Lester Piggott for days, probably, and not even uh, get to the root of all the success that he has had. Uh, but we send our deepest condolences to all his family, all his friends. But we also remember the mighty Lester Piggott, as Sam said, the greatest. You can take away the arguably. Now on Racing Weekly, though, we are going to uh, move into this week's Racing Recap. Saturday, we didn't have any Group 1 races. In fact, the last week or so, it's been relatively uh, standard fare. Nothing standing out. Yeah, well... There were a couple of horses that ran on the weekend at Haydock that you think, yeah, I think I might have seen something pretty useful for the season ahead. I mentioned uh, the Achilles stakes. It looked a competitive race on paper. Dragon Symbol was kind of the star horse in the race, mm. but he's come up short for the second time this season, less so than the first. What did you make of the winner, though, Russell, and the, the story behind him? Well, he's been very well campaigned, hasn't he? And obviously he's, he's owned by some very shrewd people who we've... we've you know, obviously close friends with, but acquaintances and friends with, aren't we? We're Less close friends, the more successful they get, well, I think. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've been pushed to one side, haven't we? They've moved up in the world. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, they've done exceptionally well with Razzle. And you could tell from an early stage that the sort of the speed figures and the performances that he was put together mm. in handicap suggested that he, he would be well up to, you know, pattern race performance. And as we know, if you get a top sprinter, there isn't a lot between them, really, is there? No. When, you, when you then go into into listed and then probably group group company like Razo probably yeah. will do now. Um, we see that at Longchamp on the back end in the Abbey. You know, you often see something that's been running well in handicaps, yeah. very competitive handicaps, go and do well in that. So, I mean, those sort of races are now fully open to him. A bit disappointed in Dragon Symbol, who is, you know, was arguably a group one winner last year at Royal Ascot, but for the stewards room, um, whether rightly or wrongly. Um, is now failing to win listed races, but the speed figure on Saturday was exceptional again, and I don't think he'll be far off sort of returning to his former glory, yeah. really. He still, he still looked big. I mean, if you didn't know that he had a run uh, before uh, at York and you saw him in the paddock on, on Saturday, you said that horse will definitely come on for the run, still carrying a bit of, bit of condition, and, and maybe it just might be a different approach this yeah, season. Well, it's a bit ironic, me and you, saying. Well, yeah, I'm just <laughs> tightening this jacket up a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, no, it's a long season, isn't it? And he had a pretty tough three-year-old campaign. Yeah. He danced every dance, really. Mm. He, he turned up at a lot of the major meetings, um, which for a sprinter is a little bit easier to do than a middle distance horse, yeah. obviously. But, um, yeah, he, he went to the well a few times last year. So maybe the stable have just, you know, sort of eased mm. him into the season a little bit more and be a bit more selective with him. Let's talk about C. La Rosa. Now, if there was one horse that you felt progressed a lot through last season and there's a, a huge question mark about what she might achieve this, it would be Cila Rosa because I thought the way she moved through the gears last season, she could be very exciting. I like what she did on Saturday. Yeah, I think I, think I wrote my column on Saturday. I don't know whether it went into the paper or not. Um, but <laughs> I said it was almost as difficult to get a haggis filly or a colt beat at the moment mm. as it was to get in a penalty at the cop end at Anfield. <laughs> uh, and it, so it proved again on Saturday. I, I didn't go for Cila Rosa, but it's the simplest strategy in, in punditry at the moment is yeah. just pick the haggis horses. I mean, the strike rate the, is incredible. Nearly yeah. verging on Charlie Appleby's 35%. I think we mm -hmm. 30 plus percent. Um, and yet another quality horse to, to unveil in those, you know, all age or the middle distance races that she could go for. I mean, she, she moved through that race nicely and sparkling turn of foot and won a shade cosily, I thought. Yeah, she was very good. Um, I think they might be heading back to Haydock later on, Lancashire Oaks, Oaks perhaps for her. Sense, uh, the other big race on Saturday ahead, it was the, the John of Gaunt. Um, Kin Ross was trying to win it for the second successive year. I thought he ran pretty well, yeah. considering conditions were quick. He came up short against Pogo. Hmm. Uh, Pogo's a lovely horse, a lovely yeah. campaigner. Um, 
But I think he's caught, obviously, for Royal Ascot because he's a seven furlong horse. Mm. I don't think he's at his best quite ever a mile. He was given a very good ride, by yeah, the way, by Kieran Schumacher. What you like to say. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I thought it was, a, it was a really good renewal, really. I mean, Lane Cash, a lot of the, the varying horses look as though they are improved for the first run. So he was arguably a little unfortunate not to get his in, head in front. Yeah. Kid Ross had every chance, probably would have preferred a little bit more cut in the ground. It's just a fantastic finish and yeah. probably... When you're riding well, like Kieran is at the moment, Kieran Schumacher is at the moment, then those sort of things go your way, don't they? And Pogo's great ride off the front. I don't think that inside rail was too too bad a spot to be. In the Steve weekend. Rosa went up there <clears> as well. Yeah. Um, I don't think that was a dead rail by any stretch, and that might just have helped him last home. Yeah, one other horse to mention from the weekend, Dream Loper winning the Group 1 in yeah. France. Continuing a really good run for Ed Walker yeah. as well. I mean, yeah, no surprise to see that she was good enough to go and win abroad. Um, Hopefully there's enough time and, and they might come back for, for one of the Ascot races, I would imagine. All right. She if, goes well at that track, doesn't she? She does. Uh, just give me one name out of the weekend that you think you want to be with wherever he or she goes next. I thought Lane Cash, given, given the, the profile of the stable at the moment and the fact that they have been needing the run a little bit to do that okay. first time off the shelf. That's the first of Turner's tips for the new series. Oh, don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, that's Racing Recap done and dusted. Now on Racing Weekly, it's time for our first guest. He is a rising star of the weighing room. It's young Rob Hornby, who's joined Sam and I. Uh, just turned 27 last weekend, belated happy birthday. At the start of this chat, I said that this is probably the biggest week of your career. How would you describe it? Yeah, no, Richie, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, massive for me, you know, huge opportunity. And um, it's been kind of one of those, one of those, well, past couple of years, really, where it's, you know, things have started to really happen for me and getting rides in bigger races and riding nicer horses and, you know, to... Um, to be having my first ride in the Derby this weekend is just, you know, fantastic for myself. Very excited and, um, yeah, delighted. First ride in the Derby on Westover for Rafe Beckett, your your principal uh, provider of rides at the moment and uh, a winner of a trial for the Derby. And I thought it was a pretty smart effort at Sandown. What was your view on what Westover did that day? Yeah, absolutely. We were, um, you know, delighted with, with how he went about you know things at, at Sandown and especially you know first run of the year we hadn't asked too many questions at home beforehand so we were going in there just to to see where we were at um, you know he had a fantastic two-year-old campaign being able to win first time out at Sandown was impressive and then he didn't do you know a lot wrong throughout the year yeah. stepped up in into a bit of a higher grade but you can see as a physical animal he's he never looked like a, a proper two-year-old he he had a lot of size and yeah. scope and um you know, it was always going to be very exciting to see how he how he was going to develop over over the winter and and progress from two to three and you know to be able to go and do that on his first run of the year was you know really encouraging and, and exciting going forwards. We were chatting a few moments ago whilst we were waiting for Sam to get here on his long journey down from <laughs> home. Uh, and one thing you were telling me about Westover is the fact, or the race itself, is that there seems to be a trend when the trials are going on that. The most recent trial is the most significant one. Um, and people perhaps lost a bit of appreciation for what a good run Westover uh, produced uh, at Sandown. Do you feel that? Yeah, I, I would actually. And it was a strange run, really. It was, it was um, you know, quite a while ago now since Sandown. <laughs> and, and even the season hadn't really got going yeah. then. You know, it was still, we were just waiting to find a few nicer horses that yeah. were running and, and some nicer races. You know, it's not until the Craven that it really starts kicking off. But even then, I felt it's only been this month of May, you know, after the Guineas that, that I've got, you know, really busy and, and things have kicked off. But, yeah, it, it's one of those, you get excited and you think, oh, Westover, he's going to win that trial nicely, but there's a lot to come. And, yeah. you know, the big hype is always around the Dante, you know, famously being one of the, the, the better trials. So it, I think if my Sandown race was three weeks ago... Yeah. Um, there would have been a lot more chat and, and maybe he might be a shorter price. But um, no, we have a lot of confidence. I have a lot of confidence in my horse. Um, he's improved He's improved from that as well. And he was able to go to, um, to Epsom for, for, for a spin around there um, a week ago. Yeah. Um, and delighted with him, how he, how he went about things. You know, just nice to see him 
see the track and, and we, we took him around the parade ring, really let him take it all in. I know there weren't the crowds there that there are going to be on Saturday, um, but it was just good to make him away. At the end of the day, he's only going to be, this is, he's still quite lightly raced, yeah. you know, second run of the year, fifth run overall. Yeah. Um, and he has matured within himself, but he's still, he, he can be a little bit boisterous and, um, you know, it, it, he, he, he was quite fresh cantering down, but I was delighted with once yeah. we started the work, he settled into a beautiful rhythm, came down the hill well and, and breezed through nicely. Yeah, I was going to ask you mentally how you think he'd cope with the, the whole test of, of being around Derby Day, you know, the noise on the hill and all that sort of stuff. Do you think he'd be fine with that? Does he learn quite quickly mentally? I think he has done. He's done, um, that's what I was most impressed with or pleased with. I was always confident he was going to physically do well. But mentally, he had to go the right way, and you know he, he's taken his races really well, especially what he's been doing at home as well. You never know with the Derby until they're there. No. You know he, he no. he's never gonna he has never seen anything like what he's going to see he's going to see on Saturday. Mm. So it's always a bit of an unknown. Mm. Um, but the way he's been going about his business at home, and w when I when we took him there last week, you know I was happy. So. Mm -hmm. It's a tough one. They've got to go a mile and a half the whole way yes. to, you know, the whole um, distance of the race to the start yeah. with a massive fun fair in, in the middle of it. So, um, yeah, we, we'll obviously, you know, make sure we do everything the right way around, keep yeah. him relaxed and, and get him to the start in, in his best shape we can. Now, Andrew Cooper will produce beautiful ground. He always does. You know, he's on it already, isn't he? Put a bit of water mm -hmm. on and stuff like that. Now, your lad is well suited by a bit of juice in the ground. Do you think it's imperative to him? I prefer it, you know, yeah. he's, um, you know, you can't hide the fact you can see he's got a big action, you know, and he's got a huge stride as well. He can cover a lot of ground. So the ground that was there last week, he just put a bit of water down. It was perfect, lovely ground. Um, they could just get their turn. And I don't know what the forecast is looking like um, throughout the week. I'm sure they will have to put a bit of water down just to make sure that's, you know, yeah, nice, nice, already. beautiful ground. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, um I wouldn't want it to come up fast. No. Um, but yeah, no good ground. He'll um, fair chance for everybody. You covered it a little bit, but did he surprise you a little bit how well he took to the track, how nimble he was around the track for a big lad? Um, I was always confident he's quite a well, well, very well balanced horse, but he's big. He's got a lot of size, so it's always a bit of an un un unknown, and it's an advantage that we were able to go and yes. take him there. Yeah. You know, I was just pleased with how he took it all in, and then able just to pop down the hill the hill nicely and, and change his leads as we got to the crossover, uh, the, the road crossing there. And, and then he breezed through nicely and, you know, really galloped out strong yeah. as well, which, which I, I do think stamina is um, going to really play, play into his hands um, yeah. a lot on Saturday. And were you happier that you'd gone there rather than having another race, perhaps? Yeah, I, I was pleased. I, I was a bit unsure when Rafe said, oh, we're going to go to Epsom. So we had a, a chat about it and, and thought, what mm -hmm. what other options would we have? Maybe have a proper race course gallop at the likes of Kempton or or even we discussed maybe going to Lingfield and coming down the yes. Lingfield Hill. But yeah, the way you took it, I couldn't be happier really. Um, you know, and, and it it worked a perfect, a perfect um, purpose for him really to mm -hmm. to have a blowout and see the track at the same time. So yeah. no, I was very happy. Nice six week break mm. as well after Sandown and just steady away into the main meeting. Exactly. Well, Rob's positivity about him, he's 20 to one with Bet365 for the Derby. I think what Rob uh, has said about the, the timing of the Sandown trial does play into the hands of people's recency bias of the recent trials being mm. the one foremost in your mind. But, he put up an impressive performance that day, and I know a lot of people were taken by cash, but I, I felt that your horse responded to cash and had a bit more in hand at the end of the race, and I, I'm not sure cash would have gone past you. Yeah, uh, absolutely, and you could kind of see my, my horse drifted. He, he still yeah. looked a little bit green, a bit immature, just in, inside the last kind of furlong and a half, but actually once I, I grabbed hold of him again and got him organised, he straightened up good and... Um, and, and, and fought all the way to the line, you know, it was, it was a brave performance, but he stuck his neck yeah. out really strongly. And I think the extra two furlongs is going to play, play to my strength. How do you, though, prepare for a first derby ride? Do you do, I mean, obviously, you've ridden at Epsom, you've had a winner at Epsom before, so you know your way around there, but it's a derby. Uh, we talk about how important the race is for everyone in the sport. 
Do you do anything different or do you treat it like a pretty standard race day in terms of the actual routine and what you're going to do? Yeah, I try, try not to think about it too much. Obviously, you do your race planning and you, you, know, you have everything in order of, of what you want to do and going out there with, with the right plan. Um, but you wouldn't want to, you know, you, and it is the derby. It's, it's a huge opportunity f- for myself and, um, you know, it's massive. So you, you don't want to overthink it too yeah. much, really. You know, you've just got to treat it like a normal, a normal race as best you can. Yeah. Um, it's lucky, you know, I've ridden the horse. I know him really well. I sat on him this morning, um, you know, so it's, um, it's one of those... I'll be chatting to my agent, making sure I'm not riding any any dodgy two-year-old first time out um, with the days running up to it. But um, yeah, just make sure I'm, you know, mentally and physically in the right place and um, and go from there. Just a point you touched on there that you you say you do your prep and your planning. You do all that yourself. Do you have any help from anybody else? Any input from anyone else? No, I do do it mostly myself. Really, um, kind of always, always have done really, yeah. and um, you know. It, with a derby, you know, it's all there to be to, to yeah. see, isn't it? Um, generally, I strongly run races, mm. you know, with with um, the O'Brien horses that will be um, mm. will be running in it, and he's he's pretty he's pretty uh, straightforward, really. Yes. In you know, he can travel well. Yeah. Um, you know, a bit of cover he, he'd appreciate, mm. but but won't want to be out of his ground as well because no. we're, we are confident that the trip is. He's going to stay it well, and um, yeah, he's just um, yeah. We we'll just make sure we're following the right ones. Yeah. Well, one of the beauties of the fact that you did have the trial for Westover early doors is you could sit back and mm. watch the other ones um, and observing the remainder of the trials and knowing the likely feel for the race. How do you see it playing out and the main dangers or the horses that you feel are the biggest players in yeah. this year's Derby? Yeah, I mean, I was very. I mean, Aidan O'Brien had such a good Chester meeting, mm. didn't he? He kind of cleared up that day. Um, and and you have to be very impressed with the Dante when it does a crown, mm. um, you know, just a masterclass from Sir Michael Stout as mm. as always. Really, how he's how he's nurtured the horse along, and I'm sure he will have him peak at Epsom on Saturday, probably through the hour. Yes. Um, you know, so it's competitive. It's a it's a competitive field, but like I say, it's generally run at a strong strong pace, um, which I think will help help my horse. You know, get him in a nice rhythm, keep him organised. Um, it's a derby. It's it's going to be tough. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I hate this saying, but I wouldn't swap my fellow for anything. But <laughs> but I genuinely, you can use it. Yeah, fine. generally. We, between it. Sam and I, we come out with a lot of cliches ourselves. Speak for yourself. But no, generally, I'm really um, have a lot of belief in, in my horse, and um, yeah, we'll give it our best chance. Tell me a little bit about. Rob Hornby, the jockey, because I remember chatting to you after you'd won the John Smith's Cup on Pavoyne. I was complimenting you on a great ride that day. Um, and I remember talking to you about riding a little bit and I, I felt that I could broach the subject about how I thought as a jockey you'd improved, even though I don't know that much about it myself. The Cheltenham Festival, right? Oh, you? you keep mentioning this, Sam. <laughs> Stop it. You haven't ridden a Cheltenham, have you? I haven't. No, Let me tell you about Cheltenham. Which you only just about held on, to be honest. Yeah. Don't I do me, remember that. Don't call me hero. Don't call me hero. I did hold up. Not all heroes. <laughs> yeah. Or saddles. Uh, you were talking at the time about how you did feel that you had improved quite a bit as a jockey, and that was back in 2019. The trajectory that you've been on since then has continued in, in that way. Did something happen around then? Did you have a, a sort of a realism about or realisation about something or because th- there's been a noticeable change in, in the confidence that you ride horses with in the last three to four years. Would, would that be a fair assessment? Of... Out of Shropshire, that helped. Yeah, that did help. <laughs> That's happened to you then? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Still there. laughs> this? No, definitely. Um, a bit of a turning point that John Smith's Cup. Um, you know, I've always been really lucky and, and, and really happy with I went down to Andrew Boarding's Academy um, when I was 16 mm. and got my apprenticeship there and, and served my apprenticeship the whole way through with Andrew. And I always say, it, like, I know Ushin Murphy came through at the same time. I think he came a month after me and obviously rose straight to the top. Karen Schumacher, who's having a fantastic time with things yeah. at the moment. And we had a, a great bunch of young riders at, the, at, the, at one time 
which was fantastic for someone like me because mm. I probably wasn't ready, you know, straight away. I I had to work at it and, and just chip away, chip away. Nothing happened overnight um, whilst I was an apprentice, which probably, I think, stood me in good stead just to realise how, you know, it's a tough game yeah. and there's a lot of setbacks that that you can encounter. You know, so I was never thrown into it and, and went to the top straight away or yeah. still not at the top at all. <laughs> but... Um, so that was good, and I was always confident that I was at the right place, yeah. and that Andrew would give me the opportunities that I was ready for and, and deserved. Um, but yeah, that was a, a big turning point because I think I lost my claim, and I, I dipped to about mid twenty winners, yeah. twenty six winners, um, and I had to just reorganise myself a little bit, make sure I'm riding out for the right people, and had a great link up with Johnny Portman mm. through that kind of those years 2018 2019 yeah fantastic <laughs> you know really good not just person to ride for but mentor as well we have a really good relationship and you know he's a bit of a friend he's always there mm-hmm. to give advice if you need it or just you know have a general chat about yes. things so I was lucky there and, and the yeah. horses were winning as well so yeah. got on a bit of a roll and, and got a bit of momentum behind me that way still obviously you know with Andrew as well and getting rides and yeah then we started getting on a bit more quality I think mm. and you know it's um then your confidence does grow when you're riding you know riding winners but then riding better winners in better races mm. um and then it was uh, the link up with with Rafe came along you know and that's been just growing th- you know year in year out really and it was lucky I was um I, I my first ride for Rafe was uh, a spare ride at, at Kempton one evening oh. uh, Richard Kingscote couldn't make it for, um was unwell and managed to get on it and it was in Rafe's colours he, he owned the horse and it was able to win it, you know got a dream run through uh, won nicely and, and Rafe just said oh it might just be worth your while coming in and riding out once a week um, and went from there really and oh. getting on a few horses they started to win and mm. you know everyone was happy owners were happy and mm. we kind of kicked off to have quite a good relationship we, we you know we spoke about things we obviously all wanted the same thing and to be riding winners, but we could also, you know, work together and make, you know, a bit of a plan, speak about things. If, if things hadn't gone right, it, it was discussed and, um, and, and that, that keeps continuing. So, um, no, really happy with the way things are going and um, hopefully we can, we can keep having more success. You just touched on something there. I mean, it's a question we often ask jockeys. How are you mentally when things don't go right? Are you quite good at parking disappointment or do you carry it with you or have you got better at dealing with it? I think I was lucky because, like I said, I, I never flew through my apprenticeship. Uh, you know, I had to work at it. And the end of the day, you know, if you're lucky to be riding at 20% strike rate, you're still going home 80% of the time losing. It's a losing sport. It is. Um, so I think I was lucky I got that in. I think I was probably brought up having that into me as well you know yeah. being able to obviously be you know it's fine to be disappointed but you mm. you want to digest it really and process it and work out maybe why it didn't go to plan and and how you can um how you can mend it and and, and get the result that you wanted but no I'm quite level-headed I think that way which is lucky because mm. like I said you are you're losing most of the time so yeah. and as you say losing but you know there's, there's a lot of things like a two-year-old first time out you just go no you know you, if it wins brilliant yes. but it's more of a, the long-term plan for, for a horse like that so you know it's not win 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 no. we all want to win but there's also a plan for yeah. for horses and um and that's what I, I like about the, the people that I work with I think you're seeing I don't know if Rishi feels this but as 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 an all-round jockey, really, you, you're seen as a sympathetic rider, strong when you have to be in the finish, sound tactically. From what I see, anyway, I watch you know quite a lot of racing and see you ride, and very rarely out of position. Mm. Always think that you're in the right position. Very rarely are you smashing into the back end of horses around Kempton or whatever. Yeah. So I, I think, as an all-rounder, you you have really last last three or four years, you know, come to the fore as a very very polished rider, and you you, you tend to allow your riding to speak for you a little bit you know obviously you're very good you're very engaging with the media but I find you know you're very undemonstrative on a, in the saddle and I think that you know resonates with a lot of punters yeah think. it's e- easy uh, winning just, on the ones you should win on and then yeah, exactly. a few that you shouldn't it's, it's almost easier to like people like uh, as a punter 
you, you prefer that as a punter. You, you, you don't want too many wells, uh, bells and whistles. No. Bells and whistles. <laughs> uh, you just want someone who's going to get, get focused on the job, and get the job done. Um, and that's where I say, Rob, that's Rob Hornby. Mm. Yeah, I, th- I think so. I, you know, it's, thank you for saying that. It's, um, it's always something I, I always still now, you're always wanting to improve and do better. And you still, you know, watching other jockeys, you know, look up to James Dole, mm. you know, because I'm quite a yeah. tall, I'm, I'm quite, mm. like, if I was a horse, like quite leggy, like, yeah. you know, so you've got to make sure you, you, you're tidy and... Um, I'll put Doyle and Buick and, and those in mm. right, the same yeah. bracket as well, sure. you know, tactically very sound, yeah. right position, make very few cock-ups. Well, that's it. And you and you just got to, you've just got to make sure you're getting it right and, yeah. and minimise, um, you know, chances of, of, of not achieving the end goal, yeah. uh, which is getting the horse to win its best possible position, yes. regardless of 20 to 1 shot or, mm. or an odds on favourite, um, you know, I was on favourite, they still get beat, but as long as you feel, or I can walk away from that thinking, yeah. I've given that horse the best possible chance of winning its races for the owners, you know, for the trainers, for all the stable staff at home, you know, it's a, yeah. it's a big picture really, and, yeah. and there's a lot that goes on, even behind the scenes, which I always like to bring up, because it's, you know, oh. I, I'm lucky enough to be associated with an incredible team at Parkhouse Stables, you know, call it, Andrew Boardings, but it's so much bigger than that. It's, there's, it's there's so many. Yeah, it's it's exactly, it city is getting like a city. And it's now. grown and grown and grown. Now it's, you know, you almost need like a segue to get from one horse yeah. to the next. It's, <laughs> um, it's crazy. But even and at Beckett's as well, yeah. everyone works so hard. It's, um, I'm the one on the Saturdays or on the Mondays that I'm on the television, but there's so much more that mm. goes on, which, um, which I'm hugely grateful of because yeah. without them, you know, I wouldn't be able to do it. You mentioned segues. You know, in television, we love a good segue. And you just mentioned James Doyle, uh, someone you looked up to, someone you look up to, and you nearly caught him. You nearly caught him at Newmarket in the Guineas. Uh, Prosperous voyage, coming at Cachet, not quite getting there. Did you, at any point, think, I've got Cachet, I'm, I'm going to get there? It was, a, it was a strange one. It was a very... Um... It was a very numb drive home because <laughs> I, um, I obviously, imagine. obviously, yeah. you know, I always thought she was overpriced the year that she had last year. Yeah. Um, did, did nothing wrong, just bumped into a very good horse twice. Um, but when you're, def- when you come a neck, I think it was a neck, yeah, neck. from winning a guineas, it's strange one on a, on a 20 to 1 shot who, which we were confident that she, she, she'd run very well um, else she wouldn't have been in the race mm. but when you do come that close you think and everything went smoothly as well everything went how we discussed it how we planned yeah, um, yeah James Dooley had a good weekend <laughs> didn't he <laughs> yeah, at least you made him feel old by saying you look up to him <laughs> yeah yeah that's, yeah, that's true, yeah, that's true. Um, and enough about this riding what about the cricket career how's that going you know what? It's going really well. I played on Wednesday um, over in West Ilsley for for yeah. near to Mick's yard, yeah, yeah. For, for the village team there, and I I knocked a decent thirty one. Um, Is it what what uh, what format of match was it? Twenty twenty, okay. yeah, twenty twenty. I'm guessing off fifteen balls, is it? The uh, yes. Um, right. No, <laughs> no, they, um, no, yeah. <laughs> no it, it actually, um, I quite, I quite enjoy my cricket and, and, and my, my golf as well. But uh, yeah, yeah, they they have games every Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday handicap, evening. golf handicap, golf handicap. I'm going to say twelve. This is on film. <laughs> yeah. Well, if a jockey says twelve, yeah. you cut that in half. That's the reality. An Irish handicap. Yeah, yeah. Handicap. very much so. Yes, badly handicapped in Ireland, yeah. well handicapped in Britain. <laughs> yeah. um, we should talk very briefly about a couple of other big races, if we can, on the weekend. Now, a filly you know quite well is Moon de Vega, who is heading to the Oaks. Uh, not sure about riding plans, whether that's confirmed or not. Just your own opinion on the Oaks and on her chances, whether you're on board or, or not. Yeah, Moon de Vega, she's, um, she's in fine, fine health at home. Um, I thought she's just a little bit unlucky at Chester. Yeah. We, were, we had a, an inside draw first one of the year. She was a little bit slow out and, and I, I lost my track position that I wanted to do. You know, we were confident that she'd... Can that she'd there, yeah, exactly. Well. It was a... A typical kind of Chester nightmare, really. Um, Ryan was able to get 
get up there and across and switch. And um, and and I was always just chasing mm. chasing where I wanted to be. Really, she ran on really well, you know, without getting getting her, her run at all. So yeah, if she if she does go on run on on Friday, um, I'm I'm confident the, the track will be fine for her and um, and the trip as well. She'll stay very well. So no, she's she's very well at home. Um, not too sure what price she is, but she's thirty three. Yeah, well, she, yeah, she's. Um, You've, you're obviously obviously seen the the Gosden fillies at the top, Emily up, John and. And Nashua, um, who do you think's the? Yeah, Nashua. I was really taken by her her performances from what she's done. I, I know Holly Dill quite well, and she's very excited about mm. about this horse. Um, she, she, I thought, a little bit, a little bit fresh at Newbury, a bit keen. Mm. So she had to drop in at Haydock, but settled quite nicely. I thought. Um, obviously, the the trip might be a bit of a, a bit of a question mark yeah. um, for her. But she looks very impressive, beautifully bred horse, and um, you know, um, Gosden's are taken a strong, a strong pair of horses there. Oh, as, you know, Emily up John was um, had had the spin around at Epsom. On the yeah, morning, on the morning. morning, I didn't actually Christmas. see it. I, I just watched the recording, um, but she looked to, to take it all in very well. I think Fra- Frankie was very pleased with her, and mm-hmm. um, yeah, she's been mightily impressive. I actually rode in the race. Um, at Sandown when, when she won mm. and she, she she left this for dust mm. um, looked impressive hit the line strong you know stamina with her as well is not going to be a question I, yeah. I, I feel and you know it looks it looks a competitive oaks she's mm. uncomplicated what about a couple of your right you've got a ride possibly in the woodcut on the filly that ran at Nottingham yeah yeah keep bidding she, she's she's going to go there she would have come forward a, a great deal for that uh, you gave her one tap, didn't you? yeah it was it was she was a little bit rushed off her feet early. Yeah. You know, I had to let her really warm into the race through the middle part. She hit a few ridges and then mm. ran home nicely. She, mm. you know, she probably looking at it, it would be the one to take out of the race. Yeah, um, she looked a six foot. Yeah, all over it really. Um, you know, she, she hit the line strong, and, and but she was learning throughout the whole experience of Nottingham. So she'll have taken a lot away from that, which is. Yeah. is Encouraging for a second. Yeah, and then you've got one in the handicap, the Marmot Quarter handicap, Victory Charm. Good old Victory Charm. <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a good old st- stable mm. star, really. Um, yeah, he's he's actually got some decent form around Epsom yeah, as well. Yeah. You know, he, City and Suburban. Yeah, yeah, he did. He he's um, he goes very well at the track. Mm. He's one of those if he's if he's on song on the day and he can get a, you know, do things the right way around. He likes to get to the front and. Um, you know, grind it out that way. Um, he'd have a he'd have a great chance. I was just looking at his profile earlier, and when he returns to the track between sort of eleven and sixteen days, he's got like a six six wins from eleven runs. An incredible strike rate, really. So he takes his racing well. Yeah, he that's does. Sort of yeah. Stats you came here for. Uh, that's yeah. that's what I like to hear. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's corner. Cool, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's um, yeah, he's in he's in good health, and um, and like I say, it's always a a big advantage when when a horse has course and distance form. Yeah. You know, at, at a place like Epsom. Definitely. Uh, can I just get your thoughts on who you think might win the Coronation Cup? With Manobo, Pile yeah, Driver. Pile I imagine it would be hard for Martin Dwyer to watch it would be as hard. he's injured again. I know, for yeah. Martin, he's, um, he's not had a lot of luck, has he? And at least he won't be crying on television again, will he? <laughs> well, he cried last year when he won <laughs> on Pile Driver. He was very tearful. He did say, very I don't emotional. even know what's happened to very, me here. Very emotional. I don't know. Yeah. I hope he got a lot of plenty of stick <laughs> in the rain room. He said he got plenty of stick. Well, no, he'll be smiling enough to see Liverpool lose a championship. <laughs> yeah. Put a smile on his face. Definitely. No, I think Pile Driver is um, yeah. kind of the, you know, hot, brings brings the best form into the race. I thought he was a bit unlucky he in May down. You know, yeah. he, he, I think William Muir uh, felt that. Yeah. I think he should have won. He tends to go, he tends to lug in left, doesn't he? Yeah, in, well, in, Mar- to be fair, Martin races. gave the horse a very good yeah. ride last year, got to the rail. Well, that's it, because he tried to slow it up, didn't he? He had to make a bit of a manoeuvre yeah. halfway, um, which is, yeah, fair play. He gave it a yeah. fantastic ride, you know, that, that last year. Last year, um, yeah. You know, I, I, th- I think he so has. So, Paul Driver in the Coronation great, Cup. It'd be great for William Muir as well. You know, yeah. It is oh, his. Yeah. You know, stable star really. So it's, and his assistant. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, Chris as well. Yeah. Uh, so, pile driver in the Coronation Cup. Pile driver, pile driver. as well. Yeah. yeah that like experience tried yeah. Epsom. I like that. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, and and Oaks wise, um, you think Nash wise the one? Yeah. I, I'd I'd love to see Holly Dole, You know, obviously, um, being associated with those colours as well. Yeah. That job. You know, it's hugely important to. To come across these horses and then to be able to to get the job done, I'd be delighted if Holly could have gone win. I didn't get you get your Oaks. Got a lot of respect for the Goldstone too, yeah. but 
concert halls run in the Irish Guinness. Really, she hit the line so strong there for a filly that yeah. wants a mile and a half. You know, obviously the dams was won yeah, the race in 2012, way. I think, and by Dubawi as well. I just I really liked her run behind her the song, so yeah. I'd be a bit worried about her if I was a Galston fancier. Well, you and I will be talking more about the Oaks very shortly. I mean, I like Nashua as well. You see a soft spot for Rogue Millennium. She'd but... want to settle a bit, wouldn't she? Nashua, that's, that would be my concern. She's probably got more speed than most of the horses yes. at the top of the market. She went to the front so easily, Keep, newbie, didn't she? No she time. didn't really yeah. extend away yeah. because yeah. she was a bit keen. Yeah. That could be the question mark they might have. I was, you know, she settled a little bit better, but she had to take her time, didn't she, yes. last time out at Hader, which was obviously they wanted to make sure she was going to relax and, yeah. and get that bit of cover that she needs. So that will be interesting, especially with tantrum to the start of the prelims at Epsom, you know, um, how she'll take that is, an, is an unknown. Horses for yeah. her to come through, you know, it's not her too big a field maximum, is it? And Derby, Sam? Can I sit on the Do you, do you want to wait? On the you come back to you later in the show if you <laughs> come want. Back come back to me. So, you're going to win the Derby. Absolutely. On Westover, Sounds and the biggest good. danger is Desert Crown? Probably, yeah. I, I mean, there's quite a few dangers in there, but I, I was quite taken with, with the dandy performance and... Um, and Mr. Stout's um, geniusness. Yeah, well, that's true. Uh, what the, but there was a boring thing that I learned last night about your, your horse, um, Westover, the dam, Mirabilis. Do you know who trained Mirabilis? I should know. Bobby Frankel, sire. Frankel. Very good. There you go. Yeah, that was my five minutes of work last well. night in preparation <laughs> for the show. Thank you. You're welcome to come over to Nerds Court. Yeah. <laughs> Most importantly, though, thank you for coming in to chat to us in what is a very busy week for you and what is a very important week, as you say. Um, I, I think I speak on behalf of quite a lot of the, the racing world. You know, it's always a pleasure dealing with you. Um, and we really hope that Westover go, gives you a hell of a ride at Epsom. I think he's got a great shot. Um, and I hope that it's one that you will, your first Derby ride is one that you'll remember forever. Richie, thank you. No, that'd, be, that'd be great. Good luck. Drink it Cheers. Thank Cheers, you. man. Thanks. And keep smashing it in the T20. <laughs> yeah, I try my best. <laughs> <laughs> Rob Hormy, golfer, cricketer. Riding in the Derby for the first time. Likes a bit of gardening as well, the lad. Do you, do you really? Yeah, my garden. Greenhouse gardening? Do you do any greenhouse yeah, gardening? My, no, I don't have a greenhouse. But okay, because I was, I was going to ask for some advice on that. I'm about to start <laughs> embarking on a greenhouse gardening career oh. myself. I bought a bit of trellis yesterday. I need to get my oh, rose. Right. I need to get my rose <laughs> climbing up the wall. Wow, I don't know anything about that, but I'm planning on growing chilies in the greenhouse. Uh, that's for another episode. <laughs> yeah, that'll be her main, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, up next, we're going to talk to someone who has got a very, very big dream and hopes for his filly in this week's Oaks. Well, it's a real pleasure to welcome Tony Elliott, who is the man behind the success of Rogue's Gallery Racing. Uh, a syndicate, their red and white colours have been seen a lot on the race course in the last couple of seasons and seen with success. And they have got a very live hope in this year's Kazoo Oaks Rogue Millennium, supplemented at the cost of 30 grand for the race uh, on the weekend. Tony, first of all, uh, you are joining us on Zoom. Where in the world are you and who have you got with you? Uh, we're, we're in Spain, we're in, in where I live most of the year. Uh, we're in one of our members' bars, Olivia's. Uh, it's in La Cala. Elliot Wright owns it, um, one of the Towie stars. Um, and I've got Dave Wright, he's my Spanish agent. Stephen Fox, he's one of our uh, tech, 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 technicians, if you like. Archie, he's just, he's a newer member, but he's one of my biggest owners. We've got a French member, Matthew from France all the way, and my wife, Tracy. Bar Tracy, it looks like a scene from The Godfather. Don't... <laughs> <laughs> but what it is, it, it's, it's just a, a little snapshot of, of the team and, and all the people involved in what has been uh, a hell of a journey for you and the Rose Gallery. First of all, before we talk about Rogue Millennium, just give us a little bit of an insight into why you, a successful business, businessman, decided that you wanted to, to start a racing syndicate. Well, Richie, as you know, like I've worked very hard at getting it to where it is today. Um, I had horses on my own for a few years and it became very expensive. So I thought I'd join a syndicate. And when I looked out at the syndicates, I tried probably 10 or 20 that I looked at. Wow, they were just robbing everybody blind. It was just absolutely ridiculous. It was five times the price of the horse, five times the training fees, massive management fees, 
in the end, it was just absolutely pointless. I thought the whole idea of syndicates was something completely different. So we've set up on our own. Um, we've got 230 members now, and we're firing on all cylinders. So what made you choose Tom Clover? It was an interesting question. I was with Peter Chappellheim for 10 years, and he's an absolute star of a man. And to be fair, it was only this weekend when he done his bit in the Racing Post about mental illness um, and all that went with it that I finally, finally got the, to the bottom of Peter. And I was sort of, I wasn't pushed away, but I felt like I was being pushed away. And it all turns out to be down to Peter's mental illness. He's an absolute star of a trainer, an absolute star of a man. Obviously, he was suffering without us knowing. So... I went on the hunt for a trainer that would have a deal with us. At the time, we only had four or five horses. Um, and I looked at many trainers, and I sat down with Tom Clover. Uh, I call him my young Henry Cecil. He's an absolute gentleman. He really is, and he gives you everything. Right from day one, he's never told me a lie. It's just absolutely fantastic with Tom. We work as a team now. All my people, they just go there. Jackie, his wife, the system that we've got is second to none. We're a unique syndicate doing what we're doing, and we will be the biggest and the best. That's a bold statement from me, but I guarantee that. Well, you're certainly doing well, uh, Tone, at the moment. And this filly, Road Millennium, has been very successful in a very short space of time. But just tell us about the bargain price and how you ended up getting her. Because she's got a stunning pedigree and she's a very good looking filly. So how did you bag her for, what was it, 35 grand? Yeah, she comes to, yeah, she was 35,000 guineas. Um, my, where the syndicate was growing so fast, we was looking for um, a mare to breed from. And that was going to be our next, we've got farms, we've got everything else. We wanted a mare to breed from. So we went to the sales to buy a mare in foal, really. And then I decided in my infinite wisdom to try and find something that we could possibly run that's well-bred. Um, and we came across this horse. And I asked Billy Jackson Stocks to go through the sale for me. He picked out seven. And this is a horse that Jackie Clover absolutely fell in love with. And when I, I wasn't at the sale, so I hadn't seen her in the flesh. And then when we did see her, she... She is absolutely fantastic. She's a good size. She's bred the right way. We're absolutely, we're fearing nothing on Oaks Day. We're going there to run a big race. She's absolutely gorgeous. We had 60,000 guineas. I said to Jackie, go to 60,000. When she went for 35, we was amazed. Um, Jackie was really emotional. I was bidding on the phone with Jackie. Just... We, maybe it's fate. I don't know everything. Rose Millennium, the Queen, every, everything seems, the stars seem to be aligning. Um, and for what we do, I believe so much in karma, everything is coming together for us. So I hope we run a massive race for, for myself and the whole team involved. Tony, can I ask two quick questions? Um, first one, how do you get tight people like Rishi to stump up the supplementary fee? And secondly, how do you deal with awkward owners <laughs> like Rishi who think they know more than you do? Sorry, I didn't get that. <laughs> Good answer, Tony. <laughs> very diplomatic, Tony. It's very easy to get Rishi to part up once you know the horse is good. Is it? We've all had to put 100 quid in each or something. Yeah. It's, we just had to give up our prize money, really. Bargain. Uh, and, and Tony, uh, the one thing I've, in the last few weeks, uh, I've, I've heard from you quite often is the fact that you cannot sleep. You cannot stop thinking about Oaks Day. You've gone on and on and on and on about the fact that you're so excited that you're not getting any sleep and you're boring the rest of the syndicate by all accounts of the fact that you just cannot think about anything else other than Rogue Millennium running in the Oaks. Are you still feeling like that? Is the feeling getting any worse? It's just incredible. I'm actually, I'm on the sleeping tablets for the last two nights. <laughs> I'm actually getting myself back together. It's just... All the lads here, we're all coming from Spain on Thursday for Friday. We've got a double-decker bus. Epsom have looked after us. It's been absolutely incredible. And, and genuinely, Tony, you know, we've talked about this. Uh, do you think she can win the race? 100%. £30,000 is a lot for us. Um, and we, we haven't given that up too easy. That's why we were very late um, paying the money. We wanted to make sure she was 100%. 
She's working the best she's ever worked. I would say we could do with a little bit of rain there, which is um, predicted over the next couple of days. I mean, most of the other horses haven't gone that trip yet. Uh, and we know she's going to get that and a bit more. And strong, she'll get it strong. She looks fantastic. We're just so excited. I mean, we're only a bunch of normal people, and we're out there with all the big boys, just living the dream, absolutely living the dream. And Tony, uh, we really appreciate you joining us and all the team in Spain. Cannot wait to see you all at Epsom on Friday. Uh, and I really hope that whatever happens, you get a good night's kip in, uh, because I hope that you're going to be able to enjoy everything that goes with having your first classic runner, the Rogues Gallery, their first classic runner at Epsom in the Oaks, Rogue Millennium, Tom Clover, Jack Mitchell and team. We're wishing you and all the Rogues Cheers. the very best of luck. Cheers. Yay! Come on, Millennium. Delighted to welcome Pat Cooney of Bet365 to the show as we look ahead to the Derby and the Oaks. Uh, Pat, how are you? And what's the betting for the Derby, first of all, looking like? Well, yes, it's an intriguing market, really. And I think the interesting thing about the Derby is just how strong the favourite is, Desert Crown. And I think you can attribute that to just how confident Sir Michael Stout seems to be about his chances. Normally, Sir Michael is very reticent and plays things down, but uh, he's been very quick to compare him to some of the good ones that he's had. And the punters have, have, have piled on accordingly. He's now seven to four uh, for the Derby now. And of course, I think we all fell in love with him when he won the Dante so well. He's had beaten horses in the Dante. Workforce got beaten the Dante and won at Epsom. So it's all there in, in place for him. He's a rock solid favourite in the race at the moment. And uh, the other ones are pretty much friendless at the moment. Stone Age had a short spell as Derby favourite, didn't he, until the Dante, but he's relatively easy to back. And then the rest of them is 10 to 1 bar at the moment, and that's changing the Nagars and Pisba deal. Of course, with Frankie aboard that one, that's going to be popular as well, so I'm sure he'll be single figures, but uh, really the story of the market is just how solid this favourite is, and uh, I think it's going to continue to be that way. I, I want to, obviously, Derby Day over the last... For, for history, there are a couple of names, Pat and Sam, that you know, obviously when, when poignantly we talk about Leicester. You just briefly mentioned Frankie. Whatever he rides, you know that's going to be backed. And obviously whatever Aidan O'Brien and Ryan Moore team up with. Have you got a, a feel for whether or not Pitts Badil, as I've been told that it's called, uh, and one of the O'Brien horses, whether it's the one that Ryan Stone Age or, or whatever, do you, do you think that that's, that's ever going to play this week? that those two horses might end up, or two horses might end up being backed against Desert Crown, or do you feel it's, it's all one-way traffic? It's just all one-way traffic at the moment, and I, I think it's quite telling that Frankie is on uh, Donica's horse. You would have thought, wouldn't you, Aiden would have been quick to snap him up for one of his other ones. So I think the horses like changing of the guard star of India's, of, of Aiden's, I think there'll be drifters in the market. And I think, you know, the way the market is, everyone's going to be adventurous on the day and bet to a low percentage. So I think some of these horses might, you know, they're 33 to 1 chances. I'm sure there'll be at least 50 on the day. So there could be some each way angles in the race. And, uh, you know, you talk about uh, what the public are going to latch on. Obviously, Frankie is one. But if Holly Doyle gets a ride in the race, then that would really be a story. She might win the Oaks, of course, the day before. So we're just waiting to see what the, the jockey bookings pan out as uh, when we get to the final declarations. But I, I, honestly, as things stand at the moment, um, Desert Crown is a solid favourite for this one. All our guests are producing such beautiful segues because now we lead into <laughs> the Oaks. Uh, and Holly Doyle will be on Nashua. Uh, a lot of people, uh, myself included, think that might be the one to be. What, what's the market saying? Well, the market has been very much uh, one-way traffic in this one. Emily Upjohn um, has been a solid favourite. And, of course, then you've got Nashua with uh, Holly aboard. And that just sits there at 9-2 to two, and then 7-1 to one, uh, each of two as we speak, Concert Hall and Tuesday. And I think I think Concert Hall was a bit of an eye-catcher in the Irish 1000 guineas. She did stay on very well to be third. And you wonder what she's going to be like over the, the, the longer trip. And um, you'd have to say that... Um, the mile and a half would suit her very well. The, her mum uh, was won the Oaks, of course, so the trip would be no problem for her. You're watching a race live Never at the moment, sleep, is Jack? Does he? You're Never like, what a multitasker. You know, you say men can't. <laughs> Excellent. Have you, had, have you had a bet in this race, Pat, or are you just watching it for a laugh? <laughs> Always doing research here, yeah. But uh, you look at the favourite for this Oaks, and, you know, 
I was at Sandown when she made a, a seasonal reappearance and uh, th there was some well-bred fillies in opposition to her, but there was no chat about them. And when she won so handily, we were all a bit, well, OK, uh, you know, I'm not sure what she beat, but the time was very good. And then, of course, she's come out and won at York after that. But whether she should be as short as she is in the market remains to be seen. But again, connections, as with the Derby favourite, we've been quick to compare her favourably with previous Oaks winners as well. So you never no, know. But Sam, got John Gosden uh, compared her with Togruta. Yeah, I know. It was a bit rather ominous, wasn't it? It's amazing that she went off odds against at Sandown. Yes. Wasn't it? Um, Pat, did you see an avalanche of money for her? I know I was with you that weekend. Did you see much money for her after Sandown? Sandown? Not really. I think th this was probably the start of the Oaks trials, really, wasn't it? I, I think uh, we, we then had the 1,000 guineas after that and no real Oaks candidates emerged in that one. And I think she just got more and more popular as as the other Oaks trials came and went, really. And then, of course, when she did win at York, it did. she did look the part. But then, you know, you, know, you, you have to say that uh, the one Holly Doyle rides is, is, was just visually as I, uh, easy on the eye. But uh, it's just, I think it's quite telling really that you know you know john gosson he, he he doesn't seem to be saying much about the second favorite so uh this favorite she she really could be very talented but then you know uh, i think in terms of value uh, i think there's better even money chances or round about that price around at the moment in other races so uh, I, I think we might be one of these races where the bookmakers think emily up john that sort of price we want to be taking her on at that so again don't be surprised if uh, other horses are backed uh, from an each way angle and of course as a you talk about Frankie. Well, I can tell you that Holly Doyle is the most popular jockey riding today. She's an, always in multiple bets. So that price isn't going to be drifting on the second favourite. Interesting. I just wondered whether you'd had any money for the, the Aidan O'Brien too, you know, Tuesday and Concert Hall, who really ran through the line strongly in the guineas. Yeah, I think um, Tuesday was probably the, the anti-post mover when the season got going. Uh, there was a few quid flying around for her and we were all trying to guess or which one would be the stable's number one candidate. And, of course, she did run very well in, in, uh, in the, uh, the English skinnies. And, of course, she's only a three-year-old in June, so she's a late developer. So she's, uh, she's surely, clearly shown a, a high level of ability. But um, whether or not you would look at her run last time out and say that was an improved run, I, I, I'm not so sure about it. It's an interesting decision as to what uh, Ryan Moore's going to end up on. But uh, I do think from a pedigree point of view, you, you could look at... Uh, concert hall and say well okay that one's sure to improve over the step up in trip but we wait and see i mean th there are other horses in the race that have been popular in the market and uh the one that has been supplemented rogue millennium uh she won the lingfield oaks trial and she won in good style and she could be an interesting angle as well there's lots of horses here with the good levels of form and of course you've got the likes of thoughts of june who form has got a boost over the weekend from her uh, classic trial so as I say, a lot, a lot of reasons to get this favourite beaten in the Oaks, but uh, maybe I'm, I'm possibly I'm more confident about getting the Philly favourite beat in the Oaks than I am the, the Derby favourite beaten. Well, Pat, as always, uh, a joy to chat to you. Um, and I hope that whatever you backed in that race that you're watching whilst chatting to us won. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think it was an unlucky third. <laughs> oh, accurate. They always are, they always are. <laughs> Cheers to Pat Cooney of Bet365. So nearly at the end of this first episode of a new series of Racing Weekly, just time to give you our selections for the Derby. Sam, you've been you've been keeping everyone waiting in suspense. <laughs> yeah. Well, how about a one, two, three? Cool. Well, Come on. There's a crowns in there for me. I thought what he did okay. in the... Hang on, I'm going to write this down. What he did in the Dante second time was, yeah. was exceptional. The speed figure was brilliant as well. Puts him right up there. Um, so if he gets a good draw, the draw is essential, Rich. We haven't talked about the draw. You don't want to be... Doing too low. One. Yeah. Um, that, that could be the only way that he drifts, actually, listening to what Pat says. So uh, I think he's in the shake-up. Pith... Are we pronouncing Pith Baddiel? Pitts Baddiel, Pitts apparently. Okay. I think given his profile, the way that he knuckled down at Leperstown, the Valley Sacks, I love that. Um, I think he's a big player. He's a big lad, though. That, that would be yeah. my only query, really, about round the track. And if you want one at a price, I think Aiden's only left three in at the five-day stage, and Star of India is one of those. I was really taken with him at, at Chester. I, I think he's a bit under the radar, and obviously Wings of Eagles, etc., yeah. etc. They've had a few that have won at big prices, Serpentine, to name but two. Okay. So. The, the Sam Turner Tricast Trifecta, Tri Desert Crown, yeah. Pitts Badil and Star of India. Not necessarily in that order. Uh, try, right box, box it up, box it up. Right uh, I am going for Nation's Pride. 
yeah. supplemented uh, for the race, but I've been a fan of that horse yeah. for a while. Desert Crown, the heart, m more than anything else. I mean, if he won the race, mm -hmm. I'd be over the moon for Sir Michael Stout. And I do think that Westover is underrated for all the reasons that Rob Hornby uh, said earlier on, recency bias, et cetera, and the fact that I think it was a very good trial yeah. he ran uh, at Sandown. So that would be my three. So you've been on about Nations Pride. Nick, you must have it in a double with long press. You've been on about it. That <laughs> oh, I love Nations Pride. I, I, I remember watching him win at uh, Maidan and love the way he, he got low. Mm. And I remember he's that Teofilo Galileo line. Yes. And obviously, if you look back at Galileo's That's win. What I like about Star of India, actually. He's, that he's, sort of low, yeah. low... Drop the shoulder. Yeah, I, I like him a lot. So I'm glad they... Well done, Charlie Appleby, for spending 75 grand of Godolphin's money to supplement Nation's Pride. Saving your <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sam, thank you very much. Uh, thank you as well for joining us for this episode uh, of Racing Weekly, brought to you by Odds Checker in association with Bet365. Thanks to Sam Turner. Thanks to Rob Hornby. Good luck as well to Rob Hornby and to Tony Elliott and the Rogues Gallery and, of course, Pat Cooney uh, from Bet365. Uh, we wish all the players... Uh, best of luck this weekend if you like what you've heard uh, or watched uh, in this uh, podcast then please leave a review on apple Podcasts or in the comment section on youtube have a great derby week thank you for joining us and we'll see you again next week